Hey guys, welcome to uh, module three. Uh, this week I just want to talk a little bit about knowledge workers and then um, knowledge-based organization or learning organizations and, and the benefits to being a learning organization. Um, and then maybe some of the issues of being a learning organization when, you, when you're looking at uh, law enforcement, for example, uh, did they meet the characteristics of what are traditionally identified as uh, learning organizations. Um, so let's talk a little bit about knowledge workers. Um, and our textbook really breaks it down into two types of knowledge workers. Um, they define the knowledge workers first as being explicit, and those are our theoretical workers, uh, someone whose work is primarily intellectual, creative, and non-routine in nature, and involves a use and creation of abstract and theoretical knowledge. Uh, so for example, a lawyer, a scientist, uh, a doctor, those type of folks are typically associated with these theoretical workers. Um, and it's important because uh, in an organization, you need to have a good understanding as to who your workers are and what those workers need. And so depending on the type of work that your workers do, it's going to assist you in determining um, the skill sets of your workers, what information those employees and workers need, and how you can better fulfill that so that you can have a more efficient uh, and effective uh, organization. The other type of worker that the book's going to talk about is the tacit or con contextual knowledge workers, uh, the individual knowledge workers. Uh, these are your workers um, whose work involves the use of reasonable amount of tacit and contextual and or abstract and contextual knowledge. So in my photograph here, I, I have a bricklayer. Um, there really are some books one can learn to learn how to be a bricklayer, but really learning how to be a bricklayer is really tacit knowledge. It's contextual. You have to get out there and do it. Uh, you learn the understanding in terms of how to to have a, a, a linear wall so that it's not leaning one way or the other, but still that type of work is sort of tacit knowledge. So if you have an organization where your workers are dealing, uh, you're dealing with workers that deal with contextual knowledge, you have to evaluate the type of skills and um, learning environment that those folks need in order to be um, successful and profitable to your, to your organization. So the book really breaks it down and, and really talks about the two schools of thought, and those are the explicit or theoretical knowledge workers and then the tacit con contextual knowledge workers. And the book actually sort of closes that little section by talking about the idea that all work is knowledge work. In other words, all employees, regardless of who they are within the organization and regardless of what type of knowledge work they are, are a key part of the organization in its overall operation and functioning. And I have a short video in my announcement this week, and they provide a good example where they're talking about, um, you know, a, a janitor, a custodian uh, identifies a way that a company, for example, might be able to save water. Uh, and so the, it just, just take a look at that because I think it really defines and does a good job in describing this whole idea of what exactly a learning organization is and how every employee can be part of that learning organization. Management as an intellectual assets and, and the reason we want to understand um, our workforce and we lead, the reason we want to understand um, uh, the level of knowledge that each has and what each employee brings to the table is that managing these assets is critical for an organization. So if you're a manager or supervisor, you're managing assets and understanding uh, what each person brings to the table in terms of uh, knowledge based uh, information is going to be critical. And so that should now be part of our process in terms of our ability to evaluate the intellectual assets of our organization and our employees. So you can look at this and ask yourself, what, whatever job that you have, and that is, how does your organization advance your intellectual growth? 
Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does. What does it do? Because the more you know, as an employee of an organization, and if that organization is a learning-based organization, then the more efficient and effective that organization becomes, all right? And that, in essence, is probably going to be the benefit. So the reason, for example, you might send a homicide investigator to out-of-state schools to learn specific new techniques dealing with a key element of homicide is that hopefully that's going to benefit the organization by being more effective, more efficient in the solving of specific types of crimes. And in this case, we'll talk about homicide. Okay. Uh, there's also the need to develop strategies to, to exchange knowledge within and between organizational teams. So exchanging the knowledge that exists within the organization is also part of this intellectual asset. You need to be able to capture what groups know or individuals in an organization know and make sure that that information is shared beyond organizational lines or at least shared between organizational teams. So you might have a specific example where in your organizations where you can think of teams that maybe don't talk that much to each other. Each one is off doing their own thing where one may have a solution to the other's problem. So as part of the management intellectual component here is the need to understand and encourage organizations and organizational teams to exchange knowledge that exists within the organization. So you don't sort of develop these fiefdoms where or elements within the organization do not talk to each other. And some of you may have experienced that in one aspect of your life or not. Barriers to knowledge exchange within and between teams. So in other words, what barriers exist that might prevent an organizational team from sharing knowledge with each other? So here are some categories. So the categories on the left side, organizational unit and culture, disciplinary professional differences, type of knowledge, weakness from weaknesses from the, in the platform, and then the barriers. So when you're looking at organizational unit, you may have a lack of group cohesion, uh, lack of norms, procedures, and organizational inefficiencies. So those type of things are going to impact an organizational unit and culture. And so those in turn are going to have a barrier that's going to exist, exist between the teams cooperating with each other. This particular professional differences, lack of common terminology. Um, the, we talk about the silo effect, and the silo effect is basically the lack of information flowing between groups or parts of the organization, where one part of the organization is keeping all the information, nothing is getting shared. And sometimes that can be quite common, especially if you're dealing with a task force situation or uh, you're working on trying to catch a bad guy and you and your partner want to be the one to catch him and not the other guys in the group. So maybe you keep some information to yourself. Whatever the case may be, uh, there is that issue that we need to address and that, that being the silo effect. Type of knowledge, uh, again, we have tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. And those things can be a barrier to the knowledge. Um, and the level that each employee has in terms of both tacit and explicit knowledge. Weaknesses in the platform talks about breakdown in communication patterns, patterns and networks, problems with mission, purpose, and leadership. So weaknesses that arise, I think, can often really boil down to the leadership issues. So you need to make sure, um, as if you're going to address the barriers that exist between teams, uh, we need to look at leadership, okay? The leadership needs to set the tone for cooperation between teams uh, or between different parts of the organization. And if that leadership is not there, then uh, the problems are going to continue and information is not going to be easily exchanged. Interfaces between knowledge workers and knowledge management systems. So you can evaluate what we know about our workers. Uh, we can take a look at who they are, how they behave, what they want, how they share. Those are things that are important to know. And if you look at your knowledge management systems, you can look at what is it, what are they, what types are they, what are and how are they designed and why do they succeed or fail in those? Why do they work? Why do they not work? But I think what's important is our ability to understand how the two interface and influence each other. So how is it that our workers who interact and interface with knowledge management systems, how do they interact and influence each other? And that's a key part of this whole management process is understanding the uh, 
the fact that these two components often interact and influence each other and we need to understand the importance of that and make steps to make sure that you know the information that we need employees to have is accessible to the employees uh, so that they can become more efficient and effective workers. Now next I would just want to spend a little bit of time talking about learning and knowledge management or learning and knowledge management and this week in my announcement I did uh, post a short video on uh, this whole idea of information management uh, and knowledge-based organizations or information-based organizations. So make sure you can take a look at that. But the question becomes, how does learning occur? In other words, within the organization, you as an employee, how does learning occur? How do you learn things about the organization, your expectation, your role within that organization, basically some of the do's and don'ts. Now, there's a typical formal training in education that one may get. Uh, you could look at, for example, uh, you get a job, you have to go to some formal training class, or it's a combination of, well, you have to have a degree in the field, and then maybe some other type of formal training to augment your formal educational training. Uh, there's a learning that takes place with use of interventions of the work processes, the trainer, the trainee, uh, those type of things. Uh, there's a day-to-day -day work activities, practice-based perspective on knowledge, tacit knowledge, you know, going out there every day and doing the job that you learn. It's sort of a trial and error. But that's how learning occurs. So within the organization, we need to understand how can we capture this information and how do we make sure that our employees are learned, are um, up to date on the latest techniques or uh, have the latest tools available to them. We need to understand what it is that um, our employees need and how learning occurs within in the organization. So take a look at wherever it is that you work and ask yourself whether or not your organization is actively finding ways to um, broaden your knowledge so that you become a more effective and more efficient employee. Because the more an organization becomes a learning organization, uh, the more likely your employees are to be happier because they're more engaged, uh, they're doing more problem solving, uh, then they feel that they're more part of the, the organization and where the organization is going. Learning cultures. Uh, learning cultures deals with the fact that we're learning, reflection, debate, and discussion are encouraged. So you have a culture within your organization that promotes this, promotes learning, promotes reflection, debate, discussions, uh, encourages you to interact with other teams or other members of the organization, whatever they may be. Um, and so, if you know anything about police organizations, police organizations are typically paramilitary. Uh, and so I ask you whether or not police organizations, and we'll go back to this a little bit later before we, we sign out for the day, whether or not law enforcement organizations promote a learning culture. In other words, do they promote the de de debate? Are discussions encouraged? Problem solving encouraged within groups and groups and teams within that organization. So think about that, because I want to come back and hit on that here in just a second. Um, I'm going to stop right here at knowledge-based organizations, because I'm going to run out of time uh, on my 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll come back and, and finish the second part of this lecture. There's only a handful of slides left, but um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about knowledge-based organizations, uh, some of the characteristics, so that you have an idea as to whether or not you're your organization where you work as a knowledge-based organization, okay? So let me sign off and I'll be right back. Thanks, guys.